All right. We are live, ladies and gentlemen, on the Extraordinary Sports YouTube channel with our special guest today, NBA player development specialist, Hasib Fasihi of Made Performance in Miami. Hasib, how are we doing good, sir? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I appreciate this opportunity, man. I'm blessed for another day. Couldn't be any more happier. Um, you know, this is a, a blessing of a lifetime to actually have you um, actually contact me to do this interview. So I'm pretty humbled, man. So Ple can't pleasure's ask all mine. Well, let's get let's get after. It. I'm gonna start with an easy question because you're in the world of basketball. When did you first fall in love with the game? Um, I fell in love with it in middle school around 6th grade, 7th grade. I really liked it starting 4th. But um, one thing that made me actually love the game was that uh, we all know what happened during 9-11 and that the attacks that happened in, um, in New York. Uh, me being Muslim, being raised Muslim from a good home, a lot of the stuff that happened, it kind of really – uh, hit me hard with the discrimination, a lot of racism, and uh, people used to, um, you know, judge me differently. So I kind of used basketball as a way to escape um, that prejudice, and um, I kind of use it to amplify the way I uh, take my daily um, approach to everything. And um, I don't really, um, you know, want to retaliate in a negative manner. So I kind of used basketball as a way to ball up those people that kind of tried me. Um, so in a way, it kind of it kind of helped me build a craft, not only in just the game, but in the, in the mental aspect of it, is to not really um, expose negativity and anger to those that actually, um, you know, reach out to us in that way. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, everybody that knows me, they know I'm a real calm person, and they know that basketball is a passion that I have, and with this passion, I've used it to make a career out of it. Um, but it all started, you know, as crazy as it is, is when, when people, you know, kind of judge me a certain way, so I kind of use that as fuel to the fire to move forward, you know. Absolutely. So you've had a successful career as a player first. You played both in the EBL and the FIBA League internationally. So obviously, far before coaching, as a player, how was your career? What kind of style were you? What kind of mindset did you have? And then how did it segue into coaching? Um, the way I did it, um, I mean, I first of all want to tell, like I have people that tune in to actually play the game. And I had an opportunity to actually go out for a showcase and showcase my talent. So when I got recruited um, in Atlanta, I went to a showcase there. A bunch of scouts, um, you know, GS from overseas team, no NBA teams or nothing. Uh, but, you know, certain scouts like the way that, you know, I played the game. I have a great tempo to the game. I can really slow it down. I can read the offense. I can make good passes in transition. Um, so a lot of the teams that I did have, we really focused on, uh, the development, um, a lot of the players that I actually play with actually help them get better. So the main focus I have going into me being a basketball player was focusing on, um, you know, being a better shooter and um, being a, a lot more of a facilitator. So, you know, when you read my scouting report, that's usually what I'm good at. I'm not a prolific scorer, but more of the guy that gets about eight assists a game, nine assists a game, puts about mm. 10 points, you know, kind of average in there. So, um, but in London, you know, when I played in London, I had a big, uh, opportunity to um, play with the London Lepers. Um, it's, a, it's a team that's in a town called Essex. And the coach that I worked um, actually played under, um, he did not speak English real well. So my, my communication with him was kind of odd. But we had we had a, we had a sign language uh, uh, communication. So we focused a lot on that on the floor. He was a French. And was, it was hard for me to speak French. Um, but I learned a lot from him. And he really gave me uh, more of an IQ development more than it is physical because everybody knows that plays the game well um, is really you know more than half more than 60 70 percent uh, mental than it is physical so um, and I'm all my game around Steve Nash a lot I'm a big fan of Steve Nash he's a big um, you know icon in the game that I really learned a lot from so you know my motto is really to follow his type of style so Absolutely. Well, speaking of the game being mental 60 to 7 percent 70 percent you just mentioned, you went to college actually studying psychology, human behavior. You absolutely classify yourself as a human behavior specialist. So how do you, when you're coaching athletes, there's a physical element, but there's also the mental. So with you, what is your mental approach to coaching these professional athletes? Um, the mental approach, like when it comes to dealing with a professional athlete, you got to first see what system they're in. Um, you gotta you gotta communicate with the with the agent and usually uh, the manager that the player has. 
Uh, you kind of break down the system, what type of philosophy the coach has, and then you try to squeeze in your philosophy to see if that balances out. Um, there's been guys that I've trained that have had the triangle offense from Phil Jackson, a lot of, uh, you know, Stanford-type offenses, um, you know, motion offense, dribble penetration. Um, there's so much stuff that plays into a factor. But the main thing I teach uh, my athletes that no matter how many – uh, how much, no matter how much adversity you go through, you got to really focus on staying positive. And law of attraction is real. It's a real important thing that I teach to all my athletes, no matter if you're a pro or you know you're four years old. But having that positive mindset that really, um, you know, improves the way you play the game. Like if I can have a first quarter and I go 0 for five, am I going to be down the whole game? Nah, you can't do that. You got to really stay positive going through the other three quarters um, and finish out strong. So law of attraction is a big focus on me um, implementing that to all my athletes, no matter what age, what level you play at. So I'm big on, it's amazing, Asib, and I'm big on law of attraction. I'm also a daily meditator. I know we briefly talked about that off air prior to. So for those who don't know about the law of attraction, let's say viewers listening or also athletes how do you begin to compartmentalize that and break it down? Because for logical, analytical, rational people, the idea of mm -hmm. thoughts and energy and being positive is kind of hard for them to wrap their head around. But like you just alluded to, the game is more mental than physical, so it's more than necessary to master. So how do you yeah. go about breaking down the idea of law of attraction in your craft? Um, the law of attraction, if you really have to go through something negative for you to apply it. You know, a lot of people, they want to just think positive all the way through and hopefully it works. It's usually when you're, when, when, when stuff, when really stuff hits the fan, how do you, how do you respond? And usually people have a physical um, retaliation, whether they punch walls or hit something or hit someone. Um, but the way, you know, law of attraction works is the vibe that you send out. You hold the anger, you hold the energy. You release positivity. You gotta really speak into existence of how you want the result to come. So a lot of the stuff I really uh, focus on daily. Um, you know, when I when I and I understand energies real well. And when I interact with people, whether it's at a professional job or in an interview or you know teaching or playing with someone, you know, body language is key. And you know, if you can't provide by a, a positive body language, you know, somebody else is going to take that energy. So if you're providing positive body languages, you know, everybody else will feed off of that and actually get better. So um, law of attraction is really more of into thinking of good, you know, releasing the, you know, getting rid of the bad, uh, telling yourself that you're great at anything you do. Um, and then, you know, in that state of mind, it can really happen. So a lot of my viewers, a lot of my people that actually follow me on a daily basis and they, you know, they've been congratulating me and on the progress that I've had and, you know, and I've been humbled, you know, I haven't made it yet, but at the same time I look at it as like, you know, I, no matter what type of adversity I go through, I got to give back that positive vibe to those people that are going through the struggle, that are going to the issues of not having a job. Cause I know I got friends that are not employed. I got friends that don't got college degrees and they're going through it. Um, but I always tell them, like, look, you know, my path was not easy, but I stayed positive through it. And I kind of applied a, a spiritual personality along the way, no matter what religion you have, but just being spiritually connected to your career and to your, um, your mission, your mission statement. I don't think nothing can hold you back. And that's what kept me strong all the way through. Fascinating. So I want to, one more question on the law of attraction and just coaching because if you obviously you want people to be positive in sports, however, guys rally themselves up and rile themselves up differently. You got Kobe Bryant's that like to get angry. You got Kevin Durant's the silent assassins. You got the Steph yeah. Curry's that are smiling while they're playing. So for you. Is it is it more about just getting the personality you're coaching to channel and harness their energy, no matter what it may be, outlet wise, aggressive, positive, playful? Because ultimately, you just want to get them in that flowing downstream space. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because certain players and personalities acquire um, they require, excuse me, um, positive aggression. Mm -hmm. uh, most players really need. Um, not the soft talk. They need that hard talk, but it's positive. They might need some cuss words here and there. Um, but you got to really understand how that player is really channeled into either the training session or the game. So a lot of the stuff that's detailed under that matter is really focused on, you know what, how well am I communicating with this athlete? What type of language or slang does he use? You know, 
and I've been great at really balancing out, you know, proper uh, linguistics and being able to speak slang with certain athletes because they all tap into a different mindset. Um, but when it comes to positivity, um, it can be soft, it can be, um, you know, intermediate, it can be aggressive. Uh, it just all depends on who you talk to. And for example, um, and you're an L.A. guy, you know, for the guys that are viewing out in L.A., Metal War Peace was actually one of my clients, and I've actually worked with him last summer before he, um, you know, revolved his career and got into it with the Lakers. And a lot of the stuff I did with him, you know, he came to me. He's like, man, I want to get in shape. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's get to work. So I designed a program that I wanted him to follow. He kind of had his own thing going as well, but my thing was, like, really focusing on what can I do to bring him back into the league because I know he played in China. Um, so when I, when I designed the program, I realized there's a lot of things that he needed to do, but his mindset, you know, I wanted to get to know him better. I asked him a bunch of questions, what he's went through, what was it like playing with Kobe? Um, you know, things like that. And I understood his body language and I was actually, he's the type of player that requires positive aggression. So when I speak to him and I talk to him, we always have a good vibe and he's a, he's a real humble dude. Everybody talks negative about him, but, you know, he's a good guy. You just got to understand why he's, um, you know, a whole different person after the incident he had at the Palace. So I can't take um, – you can't take that into um, consideration because people change when they go through things like that. So um, Metal World Peace was a good example for me to use that positive regression um, through the drills and through the adversity he was trying to deal with. And then, you know, once he got that deal with the Lakers, you know, I was overwhelmed. Like, man, you made it, you know, so um, – and that was a really humble, humbling experience, and especially with the, um, you know, the mentality I have trying to teach uh, NBA players. So. Absolutely. Well, as a Laker lifelong fan, thank you for allowing us to have another year of service from Meta World Peace, formerly Ron Artest. Yeah. We all appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, man. You know, you know how it is. I try to, I try to have a lot more times with the Lakers. There's a couple more guys. Um, you know, me and you spoke about it earlier, um, earlier on the phone about Vanderblue. Um, Vanderblue, you know, baby, 26.3, I might be mistaken, 26.5 points a game. Is somebody paying attention? Cup check, Walton, gentlemen. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. Um, he's a real he's a real sleeper. Right now he's playing the summer league. Um, he's doing pretty well, averaging above 17 a game. Um, you know, me and him spoke. I'm actually after this conversation, and we'll be driving back up to Orlando to watch him play the playoffs tomorrow. Um, but me and him been channeling in this summer. He came down to Miami, and he was like, "Yo, Haas, I need to get to work. Let's do this." Um, so the whole thing I have um, designed for him is in preparation to what he's gonna see in the league. And um, I've seen so much film. He had one game um, in the daily where he dropped 51 points, and you know that game. Yeah, when he dropped 51, I realized, like, yo, this guy, he's really up to something. So I kind of detailed my my plan and um, uh, my my drills into relation on how he got the 51 and how can he do that consistently. It's hard, to, it's hard to score 50 every night, but if you can duplicate a guy, uh, a guy's game around that type of game, and then have him consistently apply those details moving forward, he's gonna do he's gonna do it again. So hopefully. Um, you know, right now he's playing with the Dallas Mavericks. Unfortunately, not for the Lakers. Um, I hope they had called him up. Um, uh, he's with the Dallas Mavericks. You know, I heard a lot of good things. I'm not going to say any rumors right now because I'm not supposed to because um, his agent has kept um, has kept it on the down low. Um, but the Dallas Mavericks are really looking at him. There could be a good opportunity that he can consistently stay there. Um, he's a real good – he's a humble kid. He's hungry. He also believes in the law of attraction. It's a funny thing that I bring that up. Um Two years ago at, uh, at IMG Academy, he actually came to me and he was like, um, man, I'm, I'm all about positivity, law of attraction, this, this, and that. And I was like, man, I got a book. And I have a book called The Book of Secrets. I was reading it through. I wasn't finished, but I gave it to him because I feel like he needs it more than I do. So when I gave it to him, he was forever grateful. And ever since then, me and him have been in touch. And he's like, yo, I appreciate you looking out for me and it's changing amazing. my mindset. He's also in the law of attraction. So all the stuff you're seeing – about him dropping 26, 51, 43, all that stuff is all through the law of attraction. So um, he's a great example. He's a good role model, too. He's a humble kid. Um, you know, I, want, I just want to see him succeed. So We're on with Hasib Fasihi, a made performance in Miami, NBA player development specialist. So, Hasib, just like there's different styles of players, we got different coaches. You got the Phil Jackson, Zen, let's meditate, turn the lights off, practice in the dark kind of coaching. You got the Stan Van Gundys who turn – red as a tomato and try and get them going aggressively like that. For you, you've had some great mentors, some Hall of Famers in your corner over the years. 
how would you describe your coaching style, leadership approach, and is it a combination of a ton of people that have influenced you along the years, or is it more so of your personal experiences and what has resonated for you that you now teach to your clients? Um, to be honest, I have a little bit of everything. Um, every coach has a philosophy, and each philosophy that they preach to their players, you have to learn and apply it in the team matter and try to win games. So some play, um, some coaches have an offensive philosophy, defensive philosophy. Some are overall connected. Um, but growing up, you know, one of my biggest mentors was uh, Susan Summers. He's the she's the, actually the head um, women's basketball coach at Miami Dade College and. When I, when I was in Miami before I started traveling and going to London and graduating from UCF, um, she was a big mentor and actually teaching me the professionalism behind the game. Like, you know, a lot of people don't watch the WNBA. A lot of people don't watch women basketball because they say it's boring. But to me, what I've learned watching women basketball is that it's the most fundamental aspect of the game, which is they don't have a lot of athleticism. Well, now they do. Like, the way women are evolving, you know, it's great to see that. But um, the game itself, when you understand how women play the game, it's so, it's, so, it's so fundamental and you really learn so much. And if you have skills and athleticism and you apply the fundamentalism that the women actually have been applying nowadays, you, you see a different change again. So Susan Summers, she's been a big mentor of mine since day one. Um, I would not be here if it wasn't for her. She really is connected into the league. She's a Hall of Fame coach. Um, when I was down here, I really wanted to see somebody that was, you know, you know, honored to be in the Hall of Fame, and she was the greatest connect I ever made. Um, you know, after that, uh, you know, I had the I had the blessing to be a part of IMG Academy. Um, they've I've been working with them for the past five five and a half years. I started with them once I got back from London back in 2010, and they um they gave me the opportunity to start working with professional athletes. So they were the first institution or anybody to ever give me the opportunity. So I have guys, um, you know, Chris King, he's been a good, uh, a great mentor of mine. Dan Bardo, Coach Cookie, uh, Tron, Nate, um, uh, Coach Yusuf Fitzgerald. My first athlete that I actually had opportunity to work with was um, Tyrus Thomas and through Coach Yusuf Fitzgerald. He kind of helped me out. Um, he, yeah, he gave me the opportunity. Um, I, but still, Dan, I still remember that March Madness run with Tyrus and Big Baby. Still. Yeah, they, uh, Man, that was that was great. Him and Glenn Davis. Glenn Davis was there too. Big Baby Davis was there that summer. I had an opportunity to meet him. Um, that was uh, 2011 when I last seen him. Um, so I was really humbled when I got opportunity. And I, I'm always thankful to Coach Yusef for giving me the opportunity to actually learn from him. You know, he's a he's a great coach. He's at Jones Community College right now. Um, you know, if anybody want to get recruited, let me know. I'll contact you and I'll get you in touch with him. Um, but Dan Bardo, he's the head uh, player development guy. He's the one that has worked with countless NBA players, and a lot of my um, logistics and details and training is from him. And, you know, I'm forever in debt to what he has taught me along the way. So a lot of my training is kind of designed in, in a way that I've innovated from him. Um, but a lot of the stuff that he has taught me has really helped my athletes get better. Uh, but right now, one of my main mentors at the moment is um, Bill Burgos. He is the head strength coach of the Orlando Magic. A lot of people have been asking me, like, hey, Hasib, how do you got these connections in the NBA? It's just the fact that, you know, I got one guy that's the head strength coach that's connected with the New York Knicks and the Orlando Magic, and that's why I've been able to go to the summer leagues and the combines. Um, I actually had the opportunity to go to this conference in Chicago uh, during the combine where um, I think about – more than half of the NBA's um, head strength coaches actually come out to and they teach viewers. I mean, they, they teach coaches on how to properly develop an athlete, especially a basketball athlete, the right way. So um, Bill Burgos, I'm actually going to see him tomorrow. He's a big mentor of mine. He's helping me trying to get a job in the league. Um, you know, God willing, uh, within the next couple of years, after I get my master's degree, um, I'm trying to be the first man from where I'm from. I'm actually born in Pakistan. Um, you know, I came to Miami when I was, what, like 60 days old. My mom brought me over in a plane. It was, it was, it was crazy. I don't know how she did it. I'm forever thankful for her. But, um, you know, I want to be one of the first from where I'm from to make it to the league and be an example for others. Um, and a lot of my motivation comes from proving to people that, you know, you got to chase your dreams regardless. Everybody wants to be a lawyer, a doctor, you know, an engineer. You know, I try to do that path, but I don't feel comfortable. And I, my network was already pretty po uh, powerful, so I just wanted to apply that and move forward with it, you know. So. That's phenomenal. 
So, Hasid, there's yeah. a lot of perks to this job. It's a lot of work, though. For you, what's the most rewarding and also the most fun part of what you do? Um, the fun part, obviously, is when the agents pay you good money. Uh, first <laughs> off, without a doubt, agents pay well when you have a craft in place. Um, there's also the one of the biggest rewarding things I have is when NBA players actually text me and clients, not just NBA players, but clients, you know, that are younger, you know, that are trying to make it into college, that are in college, trying to make it to the league. Um, I get feedback like, hey, coach, the stuff you taught me, you know, I dropped 30 last night. You know, that's that's prices. You know, I can't put money. Um, I can't I can't put money on that, you know, and there's no price tag for that. So a lot of the stuff that I've been um, I've been getting feedback from is from the athletes actually improving from the drills I have provided for them. And a lot of the drills I do, I never duplicate the same thing over and over. I just look at every style of player there is. And I implement a program that's designed to actually enhance that athlete, you know, in a short amount of time or whatever, how much time they have while they're working with me. Um, but overall, you know, the rewarding thing is feedback, great feedback, and then the results I see from those athletes, and then obviously getting paid for it. Even though being paid is not a primary thing, but, you know, sometimes it helps, you know, with your expenses. So, you know, that's, that's pretty rewarding. Absolutely. Well, I want to I talk a little bit about your company, Made Performance. So this logo, I want to make sure I get this right. I'm going to go on book for this. So the logo is very unique. It's titled Pieces of the Pie Graph, which are coming together and three main elements required to reach beyond the limits of your potential. So they're black for mental attributes, blue slash teal for spiritual practice, and pink for <clears throat> physical potential. So how did this incredible, it's amazing, Hasib. So how did this breakdown of the logo and the company, how did that all come about? Because that really seems like the mission statement and the purpose for what you guys are doing at May down in Miami. Yeah, um, you know, the thing about May, what we stand for, uh, there's actually three meanings to May, and a lot of people get that confused. Um, you know, the three really focus on the Holy Trinity, the mind, body, and soul. And, um, you know, regardless of what religion you are, you know, when you follow the Holy Trinity, a lot of it really plays into effect on bringing positivity into your life. Uh, but May Performance, um, how did this logo come about? I was really in a dark stage in my life about two and a half years ago, and I wanted to start something brand new, something fresh, something innovative. Um, but I wanted to apply those three main attributes. And, um, you know, color schemes and all that stuff was very hard to come about. Um, but there were a couple of websites, graphic designing websites that actually looked at logo designs and, you know, I came across this one and it made sense because, um, it kind of, it kind of puts the whole perspective together. As you can see the logo, there's small bits of pieces around the pie graph. Um, eventually, um, when an athlete is able to utilize all three elements, those pieces come together and you're actually whole. So yeah. the logo finished that's just the beginning product of those that are actually being trained um so usually i have this uh, have this thing where i tell people um are you mentally there are you physically there are you spiritually there usually some people have one of the three some have two of the three some have all three of the three and usually the ones that are connected uh three for three are usually more likely to be a professional athlete so in that in that state of mind I try to implement that to as many kids as possible. And a lot of kids nowadays, they have the mental motivation, they have the physical motivation, but they lack spiritualism. So, um, and like I mentioned, you know, regardless of your religion, you got to still be able to stay faithful. And most of this concept has been built around what John Wooden has, uh, has implemented from his pyramid of success. And, um, you know, I read his books and a lot of the stuff I see him. Why was he successful? It's because he always put God first. And um, that's what I do is, like, I always put God first in anything I do. I always pray before I do anything. Um, and making sure I thank him, you know, since day one. You know, I wouldn't be here for God. But, you know, people forget the lost ark on how to involve spirituality in everything they do because they're so caught up in social media. Um, everybody's so caught up in, in what's hype. And they don't really want to follow what's right for them. Um but, you know, when you are when you have a good mind, you have a good head on your shoulders, and you, you, when you realize that spiritual, spiritualism is the key to success, like Caleb be saying, um, you got to really take that into consideration that you really have to pray, put God first, um, and you see what he does for you out of, out of the blue. So um can never take that for granted. So my logo, a lot of it, did, you know, it deals with uh, John Wooden, his philosophy, and then the innovation behind what I see around my clients and how it, and how it got me better as a person, not just a, a player or a trainer. 
It's incredible. Unbelievable breakdown. And I'm excited that that's just the start of the logo. We got more to come, baby. More to come. So, Hasib, we got a very interesting NBA. I want to first ask you, because this is a league where it's not like the NFL. There's not over 50 heads on a, on a team. We're talking less than 20 guys. you know. So, for me, I'm always fascinated with what makes up a great team. In a league where you got to get yours, points, scoring, so important, but at the same time, winning is obviously something that trumps any individual, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. So for you, what makes up a great basketball team professionally? Um, a basketball team has to first start off with, in my opinion, who's running the offense, who's really being the leader on the floor, and that's usually the point guard and um, you know, if you don't have a good, just like in football, you, you know, the same same mentality applies in football as, uh, you know, if your quarterback is not good, your offense is not going to run unless your running back follows through with that. So kind of basketball is the same concept. But, you know, a good team is always revolved around a good point guard, um, a great uh, post player. When you have two, when you have at least one great backcourt player and one great uh, frontcourt player, your team is pretty good to be built around. So um, when you have those two elements and then you can build around that, um, you know, then you can go to the two guard spot and you go to the three and the four. Those are three positions that are pretty versatile. Um, but to me, what I've learned and what I've seen progress teams, but the NBA is changing now. You know, like the center is not really a true center anymore. We got centers that can shoot the three ball, that can run transition. You know, we got good passers in the game. Um, so really now there's like point centers in a way. And a good example of that is, like, you know, how the way Anthony Davis plays, you know, DeMarcus Cousins, um, you know, these revolutionary type centers that we, we don't really see often. And when you have a player like that on your team, you're actually able to build around a lot more easier. So most of the point guards in this league are actually, you know, they actually have a lot more success playing with, you know, centers like that or finding a player, even a front court player that can actually play like that. So my thing is, is more of um you know, the philosophy and the system the coach wants to run, and most of that is implied by, um, you know, the point guard, you know, who's the floor general, how's he running the floor, is he really getting his teammates involved, does he understand how to read and react, is he able to read options, is he um, able to play defense, you know, my philosophy, what I tell people is, like, if you can't stop the ball, um, if you can't stop the other team from scoring, you're definitely going to lose, so, um, you know, everybody can shoot the ball. Everybody has not, uh, you know, the knack to ball hog, but nobody has the effort to actually play defense. So if you as a team can learn how to play help side defense, strong side, weak side, on ball, off screens, hedging, all that stuff, like people can understand how to play that type of defense. Um, any team will actually win championships. And uh, me being a Heat fan, when the Heat won uh, the first time, no, when, when we won with LeBron the first time, that was a very defensive-oriented team. And Absolutely. we were playing the Thunder. Yeah, we were playing the Thunder at the time. We couldn't stop Russell Westbrook at one, in one of the games, I remember. Um, but we realized, like, if we stop the other guys from scoring, we can win games. So, um, you know, Eric Sposter, he's a very defensive-minded dude, um, a defensive-minded coach. And uh, a lot of other coaches I met along the way, uh, have always been defensive minded. Like you can see, I'm not trying to judge Mike D'Antoni. I know you're a Laker guy and he was your coach, um, but you kind of see how that went with him. And he's an offensive minded guy, and you can't really go far when there's no balance. So it's really about having the offensive and defensive balance. So it really plays a role in the team's progression of applying a little bit of both, but more so defensively. So now in, I, in basketball, you had 24 second NBA pro clock shot clock. Not a lot of time between possessions. I've always been fascinated with momentum in sports, particularly in basketball, because so, it's so bing, bang, boom. You don't really have the luxury to hang your head for too long, or you're costing yourself and your team the next two, three, four possessions. For you, is there a, a one definition of momentum in basketball for you, or is it something that, just like myself watching, it's really just energy being changed and a team coming together for a moment for a run? Because as you also know, basketball is a game of runs. Yeah, I mean, the team that has the most runs usually wins the game, but the one that has the biggest run at the end is going to close out well. Um, a lot of things I learned watching the game, I tell people this, like, you know, especially kids, I do this thing with my clients. I tell them, you know, I want you guys to bring a notebook uh, to the second session. Usually the first session I analyze how they do 
uh, the training, oh, what the skill set is that. Um, the second session, I have to bring a notebook. And in that notebook, I detail it to them saying that, hey, um, when you watch basketball, whether it's NBA, NCAA, WNBA, um, what are you watching aside from the person that has the basketball itself? You know, so what I try to teach is what did you learn watching away from the ball? So what I tell kids, I try to challenge them. And I tell them that, look, in the second quarter, in game seven of the finals, I want you to watch the whole offensive set away from the ball and break down what you see. And a lot of kids actually come to me, hey, coach, I saw a lot of cheaters. I saw guys pulling jerseys. I saw guys um, hitting the elbow off the, off, off the screen, you know, the bumps off the screen. So little details like that, you know, kids got to be educated also. When they see it in the game, they're not surprised and they don't, they don't complain. Um, but that concept of actually understanding, you know, the game has uh, is not really, you know, have to do with the person uh, on the ball, uh, but more of what's going on away from the ball. And a lot of the runs are attributed to those guys that are away from the ball. What are they doing? Are they setting the off-ball screens properly? Are they um, communicating from the weak side defense? Like, hey, there's a guy cutting. Like, this communication is a big role, and, you know, you're not going to have a good run uh, no matter what team you're on if you're not able to communicate and actually um, – be able to analyze the floor well. Um, but that all plays into uh, an effect of understanding and studying and watching film. And film, watching film is so important. And I tell these kids all the time, I play to, players already know. I don't really have to emphasize that a lot. And when I do, they'll be like, yo, I already know that. Don't tell me. And I'm like, okay, all right. Um, but <laughs> my focus, you know, um, with the kids is more important because they don't really want to take the time to watch film. They're too busy playing 2K. And a lot of the kids nowadays, they have the 2K style of play. They, you know, iso ball. Um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to say Kyrie and Steph Curry have been killing the game. You know, it's very, uh, you know, they're very fun to watch. Um, the kids got to break down the fundamentals before they make all those type of moves that they're doing. Um, and if you're, if you're going to do those type of moves and you're not fundamentally sound, you're going to cause turnovers and you're not going to have runs in the game. So, um, and a lot of that is, you know, the 24-second shot clock. It is it is a quick clock. I've actually played on a 24-second shot clock in a couple of leagues. And, um, you know, if you're not communicating properly, your eyes are not up, you, nobody's sending the proper screens, you know, it's going to be a quick turnover and the shot clock's going to run out. So um, it, it's really all in, in, in cognitive motion with people understanding that, you know what, it's everybody else away from the ball and how they're going to get better and make the team actually convert in that possession. So. I'm, I'm so glad you teach that. That's so important to emphasize. And do you think D1 coaches, guys like Calipari or a Coach K, are they, are they looking – obviously they're building a team, but I have a high school brother going into his senior year looking to play at the next level. I'm telling him, yo, obviously points are important. If you can get me 12 assists, I heard 12, 11, 12 assists in high school leads the country. Is there not still serious value in being able to distribute, not turn the ball over, and run an offense without having to put up James Harden type offensive numbers? Um, it's funny you say that because a lot of kids they follow, like I said, um, the social media and video games play a big role in how they are going to apply their game on the court. Um, nowadays, everything's about being flashy. I think I think kind of social media is killing the game a little bit because it's showing kids, um, you know, how certain players are doing certain moves and the way they're doing it is just, you know, at the most elite level. Um, but that's not going to translate into travel ball. That's not going to translate, um, you know, playing, you know, organized basketball for your high school. You got to really understand the importance of getting your teammates involved Rebounding. There's two. There's two statistics that I really try to teach kids, and for them to understand, um, you limit your turnovers, and you get defensive rebounds. You're more likely to win the game. If you have those two stats locked down, where you have the least amount of turnovers in the game, and you're able to have the most defensive rebounds in the game, you're more likely to win. And 89 or 95 percent of the chance from a lot of the coaches and the st statistics I've seen that has shown that the team that always had the least amount of turnovers and the most defensive rebounds usually wins the game. So that's pretty critical. And assist is important and, you know, getting players involved. Um, but there's also turnovers that play that ratio with the assist and turnover ratio that, you know, you know, a lot of analytic guys um, follow. Um, you just got to make sure your passes are clean. A lot of kids still can't, pro you know, a lot of kids I work with right now, they can't properly 
uh, distribute the ball because they're not putting too much uh, power into a chest pass, into a bounce pass. A lot of kids are weak with one-handed passes. So little things like that I break down in the drills and how to make pra- passes and penetration. Um, during the penetration and then, um, you know, how to help the other, uh, other teammate convert. So um, assist is kind of – I want I think it's been a lost arc since Steve Nash has left. Uh, right now, Rondo and uh, John Wall have been doing pretty well. Chris Paul, oh, yeah. uh, Russell Westbrook, man, with the triple doubles. Um, I mean, it can't. I can go on for days, but you know the way Steve Nash was able to do it those two years that he won MVP, it really puts you. It really puts it into perspective how important assists are um, in a in a very offensive oriented uh, team like the Suns were at the time. So. Um, it's just gotta, that's the thing, um, Alex, we just gotta educate kids, you know, we gotta have them understand every position, every aspect of the game, um, that's the only, you know, I don't, I don't individualize a center to only work on center type movement, you know, I have centers that I work with, and I try to teach them guard stuff, because imagine in a game, you in a situation, you gotta make a move like a guard, if you can't do it, you're not gonna execute, so, um, it's yeah, it's, it's all about preparation, and you want to put kids in a situation that when they see it again, how they're going to counter it. So um, that's all into effect on how they're properly being developed and what they're doing in the training sessions. So it all plays a factor into that. You know? Beautifully said. So I, as we watch a Golden State style of offense really catch on, you know, OKC's been at it for a while with just fast pace, ball movement, run and gun. Is a San Antonio Spur type offense, is that going to slowly wean out as we get more and more athletes into the NBA? Or do you think uh, that there's an opportunity for multiple kinds of offenses to live? Because honestly, what's the NFL is considered a copycat league. I mean, I love the Cleveland one because they didn't play Golden State style. In fact, I'm going to go as far as saying Golden State – for some reason, decided to play ISO ball the last half half of that quarter in Game Seven, and that's why they lost. They stopped moving the ball. So, kind of going all over the board here. But do you think there is an opportunity for more than one kind of offense to live moving forward as we continue to go in a faster pace style of sports? Um, I I believe in this concept. You know, what goes around comes around. Um. A lot of the offenses that we're seeing right now, the next team to try to counter that offense is going to fit into the weaknesses that offense has. Now, now if you notice, um, one thing I noticed watching Golden State play, when a, sh- when a team cannot shoot the ball and has no low post presence, they're not going to win games. And, you know, I hate to say this, Steph Curry didn't step up as he should in this finals. And, you know, a couple other things played a role into that team not being effective shooting the ball. Uh, but they had no low post presence, and the Cavs really, um, you know, beat them up three straight games because they weren't able to consistently score outside the perimeter. So um, it's going to come back to a point where we're going to see centers in the league, you know, spread the floor a lot more and hit jumpers and bring the ball down in the paint, low post, high post, mid post. Um, you know, centers are going to come back into the game. We just need the right centers to really implement that type of style and call town, you know, Carl Anthony Towns, um, that that kid is gonna be something special, man. He's gonna oh, yeah. be, um, he's I think him and Anthony Davis are the most revolutionary type front court players the league has ever seen. Um, and the style that they have right now is a type of style that Golden State can have a problem, um, dealing with because it's hard to guard if a guy if a guy like that that plays his post um, post position if he's able to score on the perimeter and he's able to drive and penetrate and handle the rock that's hard to, that's hard to handle, man. So. Um, you know, let alone they might not be able to buy threes, but if they can, if they can use that uh, as a crust to handle a team like the Golden State Warriors, I don't see why it's not going to stop them. Um, but then it, it all, you know, every offense that wins a title, there's always another team that's countering that offense that's trying to duplicate it. So the league is going to change. You know, we're going to see it. Like we're seeing a three-point shooting team. Now we're going to see teams that have length on the perimeter to guard a three-point shooter. So it's going to change that. Um, into a more mid-range to low post thing. It's going to come back and forth. Um, so the league is being um, revolutionized slowly, but um, it's going to be fun to watch what comes about in the next couple of years with those young guys too. So I like that. That gives me hope that we're still going to see some balance and some versatility in the league because I think – when, when there's multiple different styles, I think it benefits everybody. And, you know, it's two great fast-run, high-paced offenses in the finals, and so be it. But I love that it was kind of physical versus finesse. 
And, you know, once Bogut went out and Draymond got suspended, you saw, to your point, how much a low post presence can affect mm. So I want to ask, yeah. obviously, you're a Heat fan, a lot of NBA offseason moves. I want to go too much into free agency, but has this been a more than exciting and wild free agency, in your opinion, of all, all the offseasons you've seen over the years? Um, yeah, I have. I mean, to me, to be honest with you, um, can you hear me? I think I lost connection. Yeah, I can hear you. You good. All right, cool. Um, by the way, I, I don't know why, but my battery is at thirteen percent. I need to charge this. While oh, we, it's, while it's we all talk. good, man. We're 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 on the we're on the back nine. All right, cool. Um, I mean, you know how they say the NBA is a business, and a lot of this business is involved around paying the players now. So, I mean, I'm not mad at you know Heat Nation um, being frustrated with Dwayne Wade, but you got to understand what our priority was. Um, I'm not going to go too much into it. I'll get emotional and start going ham, but I just know like this league is really involved around being catered to the elite athlete. And if an uh, organization is not able to cater to that athlete, to their demand, then they're going to bounce. And Dwayne Wade is that example. Um, you know, when LeBron left, I wasn't surprised. I saw it coming. I knew he was going to go back to Cleveland, but with Wade leaving, it kind of surprised me. Uh, especially the way it happened. Um, but, you know, with Kevin Durant leaving, going to Golden State, I thought that was a surprising move. I didn't see that coming. You know, and I don't – like, me being a competitor, I will never go join a team that I lost to in the final. Well, that's what conference. I'm trying to say. I, You know, listen, I'm all for everyone going where they want to go, but you're up 3-1 <laughs> against a squad. What would Kobe or Jordan have done? They wouldn't have joined the Blazers or the Pistons or the Kings or the Celtics. It would have went out through them. Yeah, the, the example a lot of those players are using in that era, you know, the players that they had on the team, like when you look at you know, when you look at Jordan, the man had Dennis Rodman. The man led the league in rebounding. He had 18 rebounds a game, I think, for two or three straight years. Um, when was the last time we have seen somebody in our NBA right now average 18 rebounds a game? Great and that guy was you know, he was 6'8", 6'9", I forgot his height. I mean, he's around that around that height. And for him to do that, that's kind of surprising. And then, you know, when you have guys like Steve Kerr that can knock down a three, Scottie Pippen, one of the best defenders in the NBA. So Jordan had his role of players. Like, people want to, you know, battle me about, yo, why is Jordan so great? This, is and that. You know, he, he's the best in the league. Well, he became great when that team got assembled. You know, before, before he won those titles, I think he went six, seven years straight not winning anything. You know, he would just – you know, go ham statistically. I mean, he was on the true. best. He was the best statistically um, uh, gifted players in the league. But you know, once his team got assembled, you need to have all stars. You need to have complementary players with your game. And um, I think that's what LeBron was looking for. I think that's what KD wanted. I mean, if that's what it takes for him is to join the Warriors and win a title and beat the Cavs, hey, I'm not gonna hit on his decision. But it's just surprising how the league is now. It's kind of like how society is. You know how the rich get richer, the poor get poor. The NBA is starting to become the better teams are getting better, the worst teams are getting worse. So there's no – I don't see no proper balance at the moment. I want to see balance, but it kind of challenges those players that are under the radar to really get better at the game and evolve themselves as an athlete and a player itself. So, um, you know, I don't really take into consideration, like, if I play on the Heat and I'm going against the Golden State Warriors, I'm not going to mentally think that, you know what, I'm going to lose this game. But it's more so like, okay, you know what? What am I going to do to get better and get the, and beat this team? You know, what am I going to do to evolve myself as a player to actually execute and win this game? So it's all about the mindset of the players now. So um, you know, yeah. that plays a big role. So well, I know your phone's going, so I want to ask one more question. Since obviously you've manifested an incredible life for yourself, and you're doing what you love, you're following your bliss. What would you say to those that are out there, either? wanting to pursue but not or not thinking they're worthy or enough to do what they love to do in this world? Um, people, um, you know, what I tell people nowadays is to really follow your passion, but along your passion, you want to have stability. And, uh, and a lot of it is geared towards um, understanding that, you know, if you're not making a certain amount of income in what you're doing, you know, find other outlets. You know, I tell people to have another source of income to back you up. Uh, this is not just basketball, it's just professionalism in general. And, um, you know, I'm not solidified. I still drive the same same car I've been driving eight years. I'm still um, hustling. I'm still going places. But, you know, I'm humble to the fact that, you know, I know where I came from and I know what I have to do to get there. Uh, but most people are willing to give up so quickly, even when they get so close to that finish line. Um, 
But my thing is, is really trying to uplift people in a positive manner. People really got to apply law of attraction, you know, internally. There's a lot of corrupted souls out there, and I've been interacting with a lot of them, and I've been trying to heal them as much as I can, um, whether it's through training or whether it's through personal development. Um, you know, and those people that are listening, they'll understand that. Um, and there's one thing I'm doing right now, and I wanted to put it into, uh, you know, into consideration. Um, there's this nonprofit organization that I'm a part of. Um, it's called the Overtown Sports, uh, actually the Overtown Optimist Club. And, you know, what we're doing is trying to reduce the crime rate in Miami. And a lot of the kids that I'm dealing with, these young kids, you know, the high school and, um, high school and under, um, they got, you know, single family homes, you know, their parents are, you know, either a prostitute or doing some gambling or doing, um, you know, doing drugs. So a lot of these kids are really displaced. So we have a program in Overtown Miami. Um, that the facility that I'm actually training at, where I'm bringing players at, where, I'm, you know, where guys like Vander Blue came, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather came. I had an opportunity to connect with Floyd Mayweather, and that was a blessing. He actually gave a $1,000 donation um, to the Overtown Optimist. So um, he really looks out. He kind of understands. Me and, um, me and um, Floyd Mayweather are pretty cool right now. We have a good relationship. Me and his managers get along real well. Um, he understands what I'm doing. Um, he's going to definitely come back and work with me. But he understands that, you know, the stuff we got going on for the city is very important and trying to get these kids off the streets and put them in a program that's really going to help them in not only in education, but trying to have them become good players in the sport that they're, you know, in, interested in. Um, but this nonprofit organization, mm-hmm. we're trying to reduce the crime rate in Miami. And um, a lot of people that I'm around, I'm looking for volunteers to help me out because it, it takes a village to raise a kid, you know, and – um um, I have a good team with me. Um, you know, me and my guy, Torrin Seymour, you know, we started the brand. We had this image to help as many kids as possible. And there's a lot of other people involved in that development. Um, but me and him, he's he's more, when you go on our website, you know, mayperformance.com, you see there's also an NFL trainer. That's my guy, Torrin Seymour. He has a lot more clients that he deals with. Like, he has more clients than I do. I just deal with specifically basketball and personal training, but this man has all the clients, man. He's, he's going ham. He's one of the, he's pretty much like the, the blood vessel for me, you know, um, and Torrance Seymour is a real, a real gifted athlete. One of the fastest individuals I've ever, um, you know, I've ever met. He ran a four two eight in high school going into college. Yeah, man. He's fast. so my thing, is, you know, my thing with him is he's teaching speed to a lot of kids and a lot of speed development, you know, proper technique. And, um, the, and when I see him work, you know, it, it's, it's really a blessing to have him part of this team. And we're doing this together. Um, you know, I can't take it for granted. Um, but, you know, the stuff that we got going on to help the kids out is very important because, you know, I want to one day say that, you know, I built this kid since he was four years old and he made it to the league. I played a small role into that. I'm working with guys that are already in the league. You know, I, I have kids that are trying to make it into the NBA and they're already in college, but they're trying to have that, that gap to get into the league. So right. it's all, it all plays a factor on how you develop them and what type of, you know, system and environment they're in. And, you know, the Overtown Optimist Club in downtown Miami, in Overtown, is providing the best, um, you know, facility for that, for that development. And a lot of my friends, a lot of my followers, a lot of my athletes have came by there. So it's only the beginning, six months old, six, wait, since December we've opened up. Um, it's only going to get better. So many athletes have came by. Um, but, you know, that's that's just the beginning. You know, and I tell people that's a passion that I came about is because the more you give back, the more you shall receive. You know, the Bible and the Quran says the same thing. So um, even the Torah says the same thing. So we got to be able to understand that you know, the more we give back to the kids, the more we give back to the adults, the senior citizens, the more we're going to receive in return. So um, just keep that in mind moving forward. You know, Let's see, man, incredibly motivating over here. You're passionate individual, very caring and compassionate to everyone you work with and now to know that you're paying it forward to underprivileged kids in your neighborhood that need help and guidance. I, I can't tip my cap to you enough. If I ever make it to Miami, I'll, I'll be there to play some dodgeball or anything going down or recess. Count me in. We'll play some horse, man, one-on-one, whatever you want. I, I'll set it up for you, bro. No worries right. on that. There we go. Well, I know you had some, some viewers listening in I wanted to give a shout-out to real quick. Yeah, uh, we guys, appreciate I mean, everyone tuning in. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I got I got a couple shout outs. Obviously, my family, my mom and dad, my sister. She got a baby on the way. I'm gonna be an uncle for the first time. Yeah. Um, she's, yeah, she's due early August. Um, um, what's it called? She's I think she's gonna name the baby Iman. It's kind of funny. Um, you know, Iman Shumpert is a, is a good friend of mine as well, and I've actually had the opportunity to work with him. Right. Uh, shout out to Adam. Taylor. 
Um, Adam Taylor is one of my homies. He's also in the NBA training ground. He's actually working with Shumper privately, and that's his best friend. And me and him been in touch. So um, congratulations to Iman Shumper for actually winning the title as well. I want to give him a shout out. Um, Adam Taylor experiencing that. Um, you know, the other thing is uh, my bros, man, from back home down here, um, Arturo Azamora, Sean Gray, Chris Garcia, Christian, and William Osorio, Tommy Q, uh, my DSK family, my boys up in Orlando and everywhere else. DSK, there's a lot of you guys. I would give each one of you a shout out, but there's too many. Um, my uh, high school class of 07, uh, Felix Varela and Coral Park. I went to two high schools, so I want to give them a shout out. Um, Adam Taylor, like I mentioned, that's my dude. Me and him on the ground together. Uh, we're trying to make it. Uh, Jasper Bibbs just got a job with the Utah Jazz. You know, I want to give him a shout out. That's one of my homies. He's getting it. He's doing real big things. Um, you know, like I said, Torrance Seymour, man, he's, uh, like I said, he's my brother since day one. You know, a lot of things he's got going on in this NFL training ground is really holding May performance in place. And we're trying to be a two headed monster. You know, we got more people involved. And I just hired a yoga. Uh, instructors this girl is really good at what she does quick shout out to isabel um izzy fit you know follow her on instagram she's yeah cool, she real. shouted us out as well thank you izzy <laughs> shout you out yeah she's cool people's man she um she shows a lot of love you know i want to give uh, a shout out to her she's really um gifted at what she does so i'm gonna have a lot of yoga sessions with her with uh with a lot of my pro athletes uh big shout out to sean gray. uh sean gray like i mentioned um earlier he's one of my big brothers uh you know we lived together for two years Vladimir Isla, Kadari, Matt Como, Tyler, Savoy, Chris Garcia, Adam Martin. Um, big shout-out to Ivan lopez Bosch. He's the one that actually designed my website. You know, big shout-out to him. If there's anybody that needs help with designing a website, you know, that's my guy. Contact me. I'll give you his contact information. Um, and my Islamic School of Miami family, there's a lot of you guys. You know, ISO Miami, what's up? want to give you guys a shout-out. You, know, you know, I was raised with you guys. Um, you know, towns of Kendall, Sweetwater, Pinecrest, Fountain Blue, all of that, you know, you know, it's, it's a big, it's a big circle that I have, you know, if there's anybody else that I missed out, I apologize, but you know, I kept you guys in my heart, but you know, I just want to reach out to those people because they've been there since day one and seeing me grow since then. So, you know, this is my way of giving back. Um, but yeah, man, other than that, I mean, I can't, I can't say much more. If there's any more questions I have. I have two percent left, but I mean I'm good, man. We did it, baby. We did it. Two percent. We made it. Yeah, man. I'm, and I, yeah, you know, I appreciate this, man. This is big time. You know, this is it's an honor to speak to you and have this opportunity. And I look forward, you know, within the next couple of years or months down the line, what it comes about with us, um, and especially where I'm gonna end up. So I still don't know. I'm just riding the wave, um, but I'm just staying positive through it all. You know. Absolutely. I appreciate you and the time and. It, it was a pleasure on my end as well. You're very well spoken. Hopefully there was some value for those listeners out there. And again, we're with Hasib Fasihi, a made performance NBA pro development player specialist down in Miami. Please follow him on Instagram at ZBO305 as well as made performance at made performance on IG and check out the website madeperformance.com. Unbelievable work you guys are doing and continued success Hasib. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. I'm at one percent, but much love to you guys. Stay on point. Hey, everybody, stay positive. It's all about that mindset. Likewise, you know? absolutely. Law of attraction. This has been the Extraordinary Sports Podcast on YouTube Live. Alex Monaco. We out. Hey, God bless. Peace. Peace. Yeah.